Hello, my name is Joanna White and I'm Collections and Information Developer for the British Film Archives National Archive. Thank you for the opportunity to share this project with you here at this excellent summit. I'm going to talk about our DPX preservation project, which I've been working on since December last year. The BFI's primary driver for this project is to digitally preserve three petabytes of legacy DPX sequences using a lossless open and standards-based format. The decision was taken to use Raw Cooked by Media Area as it meets all these requirements and has growing support from public archives around the world. In addition, Raw Cooked's lossless compression to FFV1 Matroska enables files that would otherwise be inaccessible to be viewable by curatorial staff, potentially monetizing new collections. Here you can see some of the films from the beautiful Stanley Foreman collection, Socialism on Film. Many of these items have optical audio tracks visible alongside the picture, making them extra beautiful to look at while revealing some of the mechanics of the film technology for the first time. In today's talk, we'll be discussing some of the technical challenges we faced testing Raw Cooked with our extensive and diverse collection. This talk assumes some knowledge of the product, so if you need to find out more about Raw Cooked, then I recommend you take a look at Media Area's website. Their events page has links to talks about all their products and video introductions to Raw Cooked. Everything about this software is open and accessible, so by visiting their GitHub page, you can see all the project developments, snapshot releases, and their issue tracker. There's a few entries from the Head of Data and Digital Preservation at the BFI, Stephen McConaughey, and myself under the handle Digitensions. There are also many other enhancement requests, wish lists, and issues raised by users from around the world. This DPX preservation project kicked off in November. The first raw cooked encoding made it to the BFI's digital preservation infrastructure that month. In this first month, many of the raw cooked encodings were handled by our Linux virtual machine with 32 cores and 126 gigabytes of RAM. Shell scripts had been written by Stephen and started working through these first batches. You can map these developments on Stephen's Twitter account, and it's always a delight to see his enthusiasm and excitement for these open source tools. The majority of the DPX sequences are currently stored on data tape, along with their audio files and a graded and edited ProRes. An external supplier extracts these files for us to a network attached storage device, or NAS, usually around 400 sequences at a time. We reformat this directory structure, correcting naming errors if we find them, and then generate commands to run in our Linux terminal. These commands create a new directory structure and move the DPX sequences into a top directory called DPX to cook. I'll just give a quick overview of our current scripts. If you'd like to know more, then take a look at a blog I posted earlier this year using bash scripts to automate AV preservation workflows, which gives a detailed overview of our open source tools and processes. I'll provide a link in my final slide. The first script is the pre raw cook shell script. This script is used once against the DPX sequences before the encodings begin. It extracts the first DPX image within a sequence and assesses its suitability for cooking using a project-specific DPX media crunch policy. Next, this first DPX image is used to generate an MD5 checksum and media info report, both as text files, that are later embedded into the Matroska wrapper. Here's an example of the metadata for the first DPX. The script then continues to run a check within the sequence to see if it contains any audio files that might not have been saved separately as WAV files. If either the policy fails or audio files are found, then a warning is printed in the pre-raw cooked log. Here's our raw cooked shell script. This script encodes the DPX sequences. It's different to the pre-raw cooked script in that it runs continually via a crontab scheduler until all the files have been encoded. It selects 20 random DPX titles and checks if they're already being processed or have been successfully encoded. This log shows at the top a clear batch prepared for encoding and at the bottom a second batch with files already being processed or recently cooked. Files for encoding are passed to GNU Parallels, an open source shell tool for executing jobs in parallel, and it runs the cooks up to 10 at a time. The FFV1 Matroska files are written to a second NAS device to avoid read-write conflicts 
and are placed into a directory called MKV Cooked. A log of this encoding is exported to a text file and stored alongside the Matroska. The contents of this log are critical to our next script. Post raw cooked is our last shell script. It begins by checking the Matroska file against our Matroska media conch policy. This policy was implemented recently in response to a series of test obstacles, which we'll cover shortly. If the Matroska fails the policy check, the file is moved into a killed folder for review and the accompanying log is prepended fail and moved to a logs folder. If it passes, the logs are searched using Linux command grep for errors we know represent certain fails within the encoding. Any Matroska files found to contain such error statements are deleted immediately and the logs are prepended fail again and moved out of the MKV cook directory. These failed files will be picked up by the raw cook shell script and encoded again. Some errors are caused by virtual machine kernel memory problems or input-output issues, so repeat encodings are often very useful. So let's talk about testing raw cooked, drawing on my notes from the field. Before we leap in, it's worth illustrating the scale of the BFI's film collections by looking at the BFI player map of the UK. Here you can see films from the Unlocking Film Heritage project that digitised 10,000 films from collections across the UK. This is just one project. Because of the scale of our collections and the diversity of suppliers and technology used to produce the DPX files over many years, much of my time is spent monitoring the encodings for variations. Some of these variations break raw cooked. Not many weeks pass before I'm engaged in another email exchange with Jerome, working to uncover what's at the root of the seemingly simple problem. So the issues we'll talk about today include handling sequence gaps, unexpected frame rates, out of memory kills, FFV1 slice counts, our non-zero padding nightmares, and unanticipated extra image elements within a DPX file. Our first problem was discovered as soon as the project launched. Some of our DPX sequences have gaps in them, and we are the first archive to encounter this, surprisingly. These omissions appear most frequently in files from one particular supplier. We aren't sure, but we think a technician consistently removes a few random DPX files from the scan folder, usually at the beginning, but not always. This image shows three DPX files missing from a sequence, and this would be enough to stop raw cooked initiating the encoding process. However, it wouldn't always stop encoding. Other Matroska files were encoded with gaps, but the metadata revealed that multiple video streams existed, one for each break in the DPX sequence numbering. To remedy this problem, Jerome released a new patch and snapshot that allowed gappy sequences to be encoded into a new stream using a new accept gaps flag. We now use this flag for all our cooks as a precaution. Soon after, we encountered our unexpected frame rates. Several Matroska files presented with incredibly long durations, very low bit rates below 100 megabits a second, then normally sit somewhere between 300 megabits a second and over 1000 megabits a second, and a frame rate of 2.5. At the same time, I also noticed that occasionally a DPX file with 24 frames per second metadata would cook at 25 frames per second, or when no frame rate metadata was present at all, a file would encode at 25 frames per second. According to Jerome, the first problem of 2.5 frames per second was caused by a bug in FFmpeg's algorithm when computing the frame rate, and he created a workaround. Along with this, Jerome's new snapshot saw the introduction of a frame rate flag, which allows the frame rate to be forced when incorrect. When there is no frame rate specified in the metadata, FFmpeg would always default to 25 frames per second. This led us to question whether we would want to keep frame rate 24 on at all times so that these cases didn't get missed with batch processing. I ran some reversibility tests of files with and without frame rate metadata and found the demuxed DPX files returned the original frame rate data correctly despite being cooked with frame rate 24 flag. So now we encode all Matroska files this way. However, I would like to update the scripts to acquire frame rate from the metadata and populate this frame rate flag with actual frame rate information when available. 
Early in February, a batch of about 40 encoded matroscophiles were flagged shortly before being ingested into DPI. They had passed the post raw cook checks, as the search against the logs had found the comment, reversibility was checked, no issue detected, as you can see here. However, earlier in the log, it revealed the FFmpeg process had ended before encoding had completed. I noticed it when reviewing files in MPV player, they were not displaying a total duration. The metadata stated the files were truncated and the duration field was empty. FFmpeg encoding had been killed by the virtual machine suffering an out of memory kill, but FFmpeg outputted a successful exit code making it hard for Rawcooked to see the problem. This revealed not only a flaw in FFmpeg exit codes, but that the check flag wasn't picking up on it either. Jerome was mystified that a kill against the FFmpeg process would not also kill the raw cooked process, as the two are not forked. The cause of these out of memory kills was tracked down to a simple 64 kilobyte private header block written by the supplier's scanner to every DPX file, where there should just be zero padding. Raw cooked stored all the header and footer data in RAM during reversibility testing using the check flag. So 64 kilobytes times 40,000 DPX images is about two and a half gigabytes of RAM used. This wouldn't be a problem for multiple cooks on our 32 core Linux virtual machine with 126 gigabytes of RAM. But unfortunately, this machine has been reallocated to the Heritage 22 videotape digitization project and raw cooked batch encoding is now running on a Linux 8 core virtual machine with just 12 gigs of RAM. Three parallel jobs at a time. When there's 12 gigs of RAM and three files are having the same problem concurrently alongside FFV1 processing, boom. The virtual machine kernel issues an out of memory kill. To remedy this problem, I researched the swap memory file and following chats with Jerome and BFI Linux system support, we increased the swap memory size to 12 gigabytes to match the RAM. This was enough to stop the out of memory kills from happening. At the same time, Jerome added a test that runs just after the FFmpeg process completes that checks the file size of the Matroska as this signals the encoding is completed and released a new snapshot with this and a revised check flag function. So the next problem we faced was FFV1 slice counts. In March this year, I noticed strange slice counts appearing in the metadata of a few Matroska files. You can see from this metadata extract the slice count at the bottom. A few appeared with four slices and one with 25 slices. Unusual for me as this is the first time I'd seen an odd slice number. After conversations with Jerome, he explained that the four slices occurred as a result of the odd pixel height for these scanned DPX files. Their height was 1,798 pixels. Slices at this time were calculated by the highest divisible whole number of the frame height. In this case, only two. The same number is allocated to the width, so 2 times 2 equals 4 slices. Jerome explained this is a result of limitations within FFmpeg. Thankfully we haven't many scans with that frame height, but again proof of the scale of variability in the BF5's collection. The 25 slices were caused by a pixel height of 1730, 5 being the highest division. Jerome has subsequently reworked the slice calculation by tweaking the algorithm to provide more slices where possible. I've noticed our slices rarely drop below 64 these days. So our next issue is returning to non-zero padding in DPX headers and out of memory kills. This issue reared its head again in the last few weeks. Having edited the swap memory, I was surprised to see it return, particularly as the files failing repeatedly were much smaller DPX sequences. Like the earlier files, these have a private header block with data written to it that we can see and suspected extra data that we can't see. We've received a myriad of errors and warnings about the reversibility of these cooks. Some were familiar like this one, which informs us that we need to use the check padding flag to encode them safely. But after using this flag, the cooks would repeatedly fail midway through the initial analysis. Jerome released a snapshot to address a few issues with our paths which you can see in this log, has the source and destination concatenated into one erroneous path. Following this correction, we were able to start encoding our files again, only for FFmpeg to fail with a message at the bottom, attachment too large to fit into memory. 
our reversibility data files generated by Royal Cooked are too large even for FFmpeg to handle. What is in those headers? Sadly, there's no way to tell. I'm glad to report that just last week, Jerome solved this problem in theory. For attachments bigger than one gigabyte, but smaller than two gigabytes, FFmpeg silently truncates the file. If the attachment is over two gigabytes, it fails with this message. We must surmise many of our recent cooks have silently fallen into this one gig and two gig hole. In the last few weeks, Jerome has issued two new snapshots in pursuit of resolving this seemingly extensive reversibility problem. The first has greatly improved RAM usage during reversibility checks. I don't ever expect to see out of memory kills again with the RAM reductions witnessed. Secondly, these truncated data files have led to multiple new error statements that haven't made sense until now. Because this problem is caused by FFmpeg, the fix within Royal Cooked will be fairly substantial. Jerome has suggested it may be possible to append attachments to a Matroska after encoding is completed, so Stephen is looking into BFI sponsorship of this feature, as it's very likely we'll see more instances of non-zero padding. Our final metadata surprise provides another opportunity for the BFI to sponsor a feature development within Raw Cooked. We recently discovered 18 DPX sequences refusing to encode. The metadata revealed they were RGBA DPX files, the A signifying an alpha channel. We don't have a license currently for RGBA, as we didn't anticipate any in our collections. However, on closer inspection, I discovered this RGBA file had two image elements. The RGB colour data was in one 10-bit element, and the alpha was in a separate 1-bit element. This fascinated Jerome, as up until this point it was only theory to him that two image elements could exist. He was also delighted to see that Media Info processed these elements correctly. Sadly, they are such a rarity that FFmpeg has no support for them yet. If forced to encode, FFmpeg would ignore the second image element, so the alpha data would be lost and the Matroska would not be reversible. I'd like to quickly share a few of the techniques I used when raising issues with Jerome. We often use the minus D flag, which returns the command sent to FFmpeg without initiating the encoding process. This also provides a text file containing the reversibility data, which is useful for analysis. Sometimes we're asked to supply a faulty Matroska, and for this we use the head minus C crop function, here with the total bytes equal to one megabyte. Adjusting this number will increase the size of the head dump. Finally, if an encoding or other process is failing, you can run echo followed by a dollar sign and a question mark to return the exit value of the previous command. I often open a topic of discussion with metadata for a particular file or email the log files across to you. So to our conclusion. We currently find ourselves approximately one-sixth of the way through this project, with over 2,000 Matroska files digitised and ingested into our digital preservation infrastructure. This amounts to 238 terabytes of raw cooked content and 204 hours of previously unwatchable video. We estimate the DPX size equivalent would be in the region of 500 terabytes, so forecasts suggest we could save over 1,600 terabytes or 1.56 petabytes of storage using raw cooked. We plan to continue our processes in their current form, tweaking and adjusting the scripts and media conch policies as we find new extreme cases. We now have a perfect opportunity to review our film scan specifications and use these findings to better inform our suppliers of safe parameters for successful raw cooked encoding. This process has just started. Finally, it's so satisfying to contribute to such an amazing open source project like Raw Cooked, one that is built upon a codec and container that offer a safe and stable future for archiving. I hope I've illustrated how dependent open source projects are on feedback from users with real world archival use cases, and how this feedback is swiftly turned into a bug fix or version update, which in turn improves the products for everyone. I'd like to say a massive thank you to Jerome Martinez for all the time spent diagnosing and fixing these and many other problems. I think Media Area's open engagement with testing processes is an amazing gift. I've learnt more about file analysis since working on this project than at any other time, 
and engagement with projects like this will inevitably increase skill levels across the archiving industry. Thank you.